we continue to be that light, that hope, to get people born again, to help the lost come to know Christ, to help marriages, people that are becoming hopeless, people who are afraid, people who are relapsing into their addictions. We are that hope. The church is the hope. Jesus is the hope of glory, and he's the head of the church. And as the church, we're the hope that helps people. We're not just helping some people, we're helping all people. And if our doors would close, where would they go? To the world who gives them such terrible thoughts and advice. So why the church? Because the church was meant to be the greatest influence on the world. That's, that's what its intention was. The reason it's the only place, the reason is, is because it's the only place you can find real solutions and answers to what uh, causes ails America, the, the, what, what's happening with us spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally, not just today, but every day. See, the church is the main vehicle in which the hurting, the broken, the poor, the homeless, the up and outers, the down and outers, and sick are taken care of. It's been proven over and over again, the church can do more with money and helping people than the government could ever do it. It, it, is, it is truth, a truth, that the church can take care of people better than any government institution. You know why? Because they do it because it's a job. We do it because it's our heart. And, and so you, you, that's what we do. And why do we take care of all those people? Because the church has answers. The kingdom of God, the word of God. It's also the place that people need to be a part of to mature as a Christian. See, church is a staging ground for what takes place between heaven and earth. Eugene Peterson said that. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 20. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I want you to see as I read that. When we think about heaven and earth and why the church, God used ordinary, unlikely people to birth Jesus into the world. Think about it. They weren't princes or princesses. They weren't kings and queens. She was just an ordinary woman, and Joseph was an ordinary man, that when you look at it, you would probably pick different people to birth Jesus into the earth and father him. But God used ordinary, unlikely people to birth Jesus into the earth. Just like in Acts 2, we see that God chose ordinary, unlikely people to birth the church into the world. A lot of the people that Jesus picked, I mean, some were tax collectors, some were, you know, just out doing their thing, and some were fishermen. And these men had already gone through whatever schooling they had, and, and the rabbis didn't select them. So the rabbis would come by students and say, follow me, and, and that means do what I do, do what I say, you know, learn my ways, and and, and, and they didn't get picked, so what, when you don't get picked, you go back to your family business. So Jesus chose unlikely people to birth the church into the world, just like he still chooses people, not perfect people, not the kings and priests, uh, not the kings of the land or the leaders. He chooses ordinary people that are just willing to do his will on this earth. You may not have to be in church to be a Christian, which I don't... I don't necessarily believe in that statement because I do think you have to, but I want you to hear this. But as we explore what Paul says about the church in the book of Ephesians, we'll see clearly that we do need to be part of a church to mature as a Christian. I meet people all the time and have and probably always will. Well, I don't go to any church. I don't go to any church. And they're always, they're always stifled in their growth. They never mature much beyond themselves because it's always about themselves. You do need to be a part of a local church, not just showing up to this church and that church. Well, I'm a part of the whole body. Big deal. You need to be part of a local body. And 
in order for you to mature and grow. There's just something about it because Jesus died for the church. He got those 12 people, well, minus Luke, I mean, uh, uh, Judas, to, to, to birth the church into existence when he died and went down and then he went up. He birthed the church by the Holy Spirit. And so you and I need to be part of a church to mature. See, we don't have a faith that can be practiced in a vacuum. This is not a, this is not a God who intended us to be the Lone Ranger Christian either. He always meant for us to be with others, to practice following Christ with one another, and to navigate the difficult journey of life with our spiritual family, the church. He never intended us to do it alone. He intended us to do all this that we're doing today. Have you ever heard the saying, friends are the family we choose for ourselves? Anybody ever heard that saying? In some ways, the church is the complete opposite of that statement. Church is the family we would never choose for ourselves. If we had our way, we would only surround ourselves with people who have the same interests and concerns and life challenges, people we admire, people in the same age and stage of life as us. And we would completely miss out on the sometimes messy yet beautiful experience of what happens when people with nothing in common other than the love of Christ and the Word of God come together in a community. It's the example I've given over and over again. Where would a granny, a sweet little old grandma, ever get around an ex-gangbanger? She would never go aggress towards him, and he would probably never aggress towards her. But in the messiness of the church, little grandma ends up loving this guy, and we'll talk about how sweet he is. He's so kind. This guy goes help grandma with things that need to run around the house. They would never come in contact unless they believed in the messiness of this thing we call the church. Because we wouldn't choose them. We wouldn't walk around saying, okay, okay. We, would, we all want to congregate the same. That's why when people ask me, what do you do for young people? Well, we, we give them the same opportunity to serve as the older people. Well, but they need to be by themselves. No, that's, that's, that's wrong. They get unhealthy when they're by themselves. They need to be around people younger than them and older than them. Come on. We need it all. We need all those relationships. But the church is constantly isolating to try to appease a group instead of saying, you're not different than anybody else. You've got to serve in the church just like everybody else. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 from the Berean Study Bible. Let us hold resolutely to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Folks, right there, we should, that, this is not part of my message, but think about that one for yourself. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we lived in a vacuum, if we were the Lone Ranger Christian, how could you do any of that? You couldn't spur anybody else on. Together, we're stronger than apart. And that's why the church, you need to be part of a church. As we get closer to the day when Christ will return, and we're getting close, we will face many spiritual struggles and even times of persecution. In fact, we're experiencing some of that now. Anti-Christian forces will grow in strength, and that's, that's what we're experiencing in our state today. Difficulties should never be excuses for missing church services. As, as difficulties arise, we should make even a greater effort to be faithful in attendance. Why? Because I just read why. Because when you're faithful, man, it'll spur you on. When you're down a little afraid or whatever, it'll spur you on. People, seeing other people stand with you and worship, it'd be different if it was just me and one other person in here. And then another person came and said, uh-oh. But how many of y'all felt comfortable when you saw more people show up? Come on. I mean, it's just, a, it's just like, okay. If I'm going to jail, they're going to jail. <laughs> and some of you have already known where the exits are. Come on. So if they come in here, you're like, poof. Catch us now. 
<laughs> How many know? How many of y'all came in and said, okay, there's an exit, there's an exit. Anybody? Come on. Yeah, see? See, like, me too. <laughs> because we're experiencing those moments today. We need the church. And we need its community to stay strong and faithful. It does us good to see other believers standing and practicing their faith. And when you get distant from the church as a believer, you will eventually be, feel very alone. And not only that, but it's very unhealthy for you spiritually. See, society used to look to the church for answers. If you go back in our history, folks, even when crisis was happening, you'd see presidents and, and the people in authority say, the church needs to pray. At 911, George Bush said, the church needs to pray. We need the church to pray. In this crisis, there's only been one leader that asked the church and said the church is essential, needs to stay open. Only one. All the other ones, and in our state, there's not even one. I mean, there may be some people that believe that, but they don't stand up for it. They don't, they don't let their voice be heard. What they've said is the church doesn't matter, the church is nothing, the church needs to close. And the only reason they can say that is because too many people think that about the church that are supposed to be church people. So society used to look to the church for answers, for help, for solutions. Now more and more people look to the government. People today, even so-called Christians, believe more in the government and what they are saying and doing than the church. It's sad when church people or Christians attack the church for believing it should stay open. Why don't they just listen? Because we're not bought and paid for. Because we, we know our Bibles. Don't listen to those folks. Cut them off. I'm serious. Look, cut them off. Just, just, just tell them we can't have any conversations any longer. Don't let that, that, that doubt and unbelief and that ungodliness spew into your hearts and minds. Don't do it. And it's wrong. But this is why the church is being attacked more than the government even by so-called Christians. Like the government's honest and truthful. They don't manipulate the, the, the reality or the truth or they don't keep their word, but somehow they know more than everybody. And even doctors today that I'm probably as disappointed in as ever, they've even bought into it. Just because they're a doctor, they think they can tell us how to live. Doctors are supposed to help me stay healthy, not tell me how to live my life. And tell me what I can do at Thanksgiving or not Thanksgiving. But somehow the church is just stupid. We're not smart. The world would say we don't care. No, the difference is we care about everybody. Just not the people you tell us to care about. And folks, we've experienced loss here. Tina Torres the other day went home to be with the Lord. Broke my heart. She's been in this church 37 years. Served faithfully every week. She got sick and went home. And the way those hospital people treated their family just ticks me off. The callousness. The heartlessness. But we're not allowed to say those things. Somehow they know everything and we know nothing. Do you see how quiet it is in here? Folks, let me tell you something. If you don't even understand who the Spirit of God is, this is how He manifests. Just the quietness. The reality of hearing something that you're not going to hear anywhere else. People are hurting. People are broken. People are desperate. People are afraid. And if we don't continue to be the church, they'll have no hope. There'll be no help. Because all the government need, knows how to do is make them more afraid. But the reason the church is being attacked by so-called Christians is because even so-called Christians don't believe enough in the church to stand with her or with it and, and the bride of Christ. See, the government is not providing any solutions and can't. 
And the reason why is because they have none. They haven't had any answers for this going on either. They, every, every step they've made has been a mistake. But the church provides real solutions and always will. Matthew 4, verses 3 and 4, during that time, the devil came and said to him when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Today, people are looking to the government for their counseling and encouragement and spiritual food, and the church somehow has become their physical bread, not very good and not very healthy. Jesus said that so that we would understand that without the Word of God and the kingdom of God, we, we won't be healthy people. That's why the world is so crazy and messed up. They're eating the bread, the natural food, but they're not having any spiritual food. And too many people, even so-called believers, I say believers, they're not, real believers would never do this, so-called Christians, somehow are looking for the government to be their counseling and their encouragement, and they can't do either because they don't care. They don't care about you. They don't care about us. They don't care about our businesses or our economy. They don't care about anything anymore. But yet people look to them. In fact, it has been, I've been told that we may be the number one place to get complained on in the city. Maybe even the state, I don't know. Number one. Yeah, we're clapping like, yeah. And, and isn't it funny that, that I'm like, why? Because people hate us. They hate the church. And then someone told me that, and I don't know if it's true or not, that someone said, well, they even said there's churches calling in on you. And I'm like, well, they're not the church of the Lord Jesus. They're the sellouts and the cop-outs and the, and the, and the, they're not the real deal. Because if I saw a church open, I'd salute them. Do what God's called you to do. See, only God's word can truly sustain us in this life. It's the thing you desperately need if you don't realize it to keep you sane through this craziness. People are hurting mentally, emotionally, and financially. But the government, again, has no solutions. Only God, using his chosen vehicle, the church, his word, has the answers. So here's who we are. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This is the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most important sermon that's ever been preached in the history of the world. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You. Someone point at your neighbor and say, you. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. How can you show up and show out your good deeds if you're closed? One church said from their pulpit, the reason we're closing is because we're going to be an example. An example to whom? All the world's going to say, see, they, they don't even think they matter because they're not pushing back. How can you be an example if you're doing nothing but closing your doors? You know, you know salt, if, if, how many ever had clumpy salt? How many have ever tasted salt that's been wet a little bit and it, and it does nothing for you? How many of y'all like salt in here? Because I like it. I like, 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 I do like salt. I know some of you out there, real natural, you know, healthy people are saying, it's not good for you, but I like it. <laughs> you know, if you go to a place that's real humid, you know, I lived in Oklahoma for a long time and it's crazy humid. And you go into restaurants, you'll get a salt shaker and you'll notice in the salt shaker, there's crackers mixed up in it. Some people grow sad, like, why are there crackers in the salt? Let me tell you why. Because it absorbs the moisture so the salt doesn't lose its flavor. That's why there's, have you ever seen crackers in a salt shaker? 
See, that's a heavy revy right there. Come on now. <laughs> but, but it absorbs the water, the moisture, because if it doesn't, the salt gets real wet and it loses its flavor. And so you and I need to understand if we're the salt of the earth, we can never get wetted down and watered down because we lose the flavor, the, 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 the ability to speak life into death. We lose that. And once the Bible says, Jesus said, you lose it, they just throw it out to be trampled underfoot. That means you're worthless. It's no good. That's why one reason we're staying open. That's why we're going to keep helping the hurting. That's why we're going to keep helping people who are hopeless. That's why. Because we are the salt of the earth. We're the preservant. And if it wasn't for the church, the Antichrist and all of its courts that are trying to do this great reset, this one world government would just overtake us. And some of you watching and some of you here probably voted for it. We're the light of the world. We're a city set on a hill. Why do you put a city on a hill so it can be seen? Think about it. It, it needs to be seen. And when the enemy comes, it's the first place to get attacked. And when people need help, it's the first place they'll go because they can see it. Jesus said, that's who you are. That's, that's who you and I are. Not the building, but the church that gathers together. We're salt to the earth. We're a light to the lost. We're, we're that city on a hill that says, come to us. We're never going to close. We're never going to turn out our lights. We're not going to hide our light under a lamp and say, you can't see us anymore. We're going to let our good deeds continue to shine so our Father in heaven will be glorified. Not so we can be glorified. So he can be glorified. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll be taking up our offerings for Make-A-Wish because we're going to let our good deeds continue to shine in the lives of those people. Tomorrow morning at noon or tomorrow afternoon at noon, there's going to be a line of people waiting to get food because we're going to be a light to them also. Tomorrow we'll get phone calls of people hurting and broken and relapsing, marriages decaying, children being abused. You know why? Because our doors are still open. Our light is still, start, still shining bright. Why other churches, God help you, have closed the door and say, we don't believe in any of that. We're just going to be, just, just listen to everybody, whatever they say. Folks, why would anybody respect us if we don't even believe in the church? And if it's so easy to close, I, I wouldn't even go there. I mean, if I was lost and looking like they don't even believe what they say they believe. I would look at them like a bunch of cowards. At least the world stands up for what they believe. I can respect that, even though I disagree with it. At least they're not shy about it. But somehow the church has become non-essential. We don't matter. And we don't matter because too many church people think that, that, think that way. But in this house, we're going to take our stand. We're going to be the salt and the light. And we're going to let our light shine. And when they say we don't care about people, I'm saying, oh, no, no, we care about all the people. You don't care about the people or you never bankrupt them. 2,500 businesses closing their doors, causing people to stand in super spreader lines just to go get food. Folks, let me tell you something. That's, that's social conditioning, by the way. You're standing in line. Just go back and research your history and look at the bread lines and the cheese lines that people stood in. We're standing in line, what? Waiting on the government get independent on them. They're conditioning us and people aren't bucking it. They're not fighting back. They're not, they're not just saying, this is stupid. I mean, think about how, who was it in this group of people that said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to limit all the stores to 75 people. You know, that doesn't include their employees. It's 75 people plus their employees. And we're going to make people stand in line. Uh, one of our staff members stood in line an hour and 50 minutes to get into a Costco. They tell me that some of the lines and from the people working there, that hour and 30 minutes. So instead of letting people just come and go and passing each other like, hey, how you doing? What do they do? They have me standing in line with who knows who. And then they're talking about we're trying to curtail the, the spread of this when you... 
when you have me standing in the greatest super spreader things in our history uh, so far in, in New Mexico. It's the, I mean, the, the, I, I'm trying to think of myself, okay, what person or person said, we think this is smart? It must be the group of stupidos. Because I'd much rather just pass you by going in and out of a store than standing there for an hour and a half. Because you know there's sick people in those lines. Because they need food too. Well, don't come if you're not feeling well. Well, what if they're only themselves? What? And people get upset when we talk like this. But man, who, 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 who better to talk about these things than the church that knows, that has some common sense? This is the time we need to open the most. We are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We are the city on the hill that God has set on the hill. And this is our opportunity to shine the brightest. We are the salt of the earth. That means we're the preservant as well. If we lose our flavor, we have no value. If we make no effort to affect the world around us, we, we are of little value. If we are too much like the world, we are worthless. If we hide our light because of fear, where is the hope for all those who are lost? We are preserving the world from going into total desolation. That's how powerful, that's what the church does of the Lord Jesus, the body of Christ. We are on a hill and the world is watching. We continue to be that light, that hope, to get people born again, to help the lost come to know Christ, to help marriages, people that are becoming hopeless, people who are afraid, people who are relapsing into their addictions. We are that hope. The church is the hope. Jesus is the hope of glory, and he's the head of the church. And as the church, we're the hope that helps people. We're not just helping some people, we're helping all people. And if our doors would close, where would they go? to the world who gives them such terrible thoughts and advice. I mean, it's sad someone come to the church and say, oh no, we're closed, out of business. Oh, because, oh, we're, we just want someone to keep us safe. Oh, because we're using common sense, but they're not using God's sense. I mean, show me anywhere in the scriptures where God says when it gets difficult or tough, close the doors. And all these flaky Christians out there that want to use Romans 13 out of context, what about the church in China? The underground church that violates all the communist regime's orders to have a church and they're put to death and they're put in prison and their families are destroyed on a constant basis. What about them? Are they being wrong too? It's the first time in America that the church has been persecuted and as a whole the church has folded because we have weak, spineless leaders in the pulpits of America. We have to open. We're the city on a hill. We are the only hope for those, for this lost world and other believers who are struggling in their faith. Let me read you a scripture, folks, just to help some of you out so you're not too upset with me. This is from the Message Bible, Proverbs 24, 10. If you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. Can we read it again, just for effect's sake? If you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. Well, we have substance in this house. You, you are the substance of the house because of your resolve and wherewithal and your enthusiasm to do the work of the kingdom and to make sure that we support the church. You're the reason that we are able to stand tall and not fall apart. I thank you sincerely. I thank you. I thank everybody online that support. Thank you so much for being here today. You don't know how important it is for the world to see that that church is still believing in their God. Let me close with these thoughts, Nehemiah 4, 17. 
Nehemiah was a person, a, a, a cupbearer, if you would, to the king, our Turk Sixties, and, and, and one day he come in and the king said, Nehemiah, you're not sick, what's wrong? The countenance is off, and Nehemiah said, well, the walls in Jerusalem have been destroyed and they're not, being, they're not built. And, and the king said, well, what would you want me to, what are you asking of me? He said, can I, can I go build the walls? He said, how long would it take you? And Nehemiah gives him a time. He said, go. Gave him papers and orders to go to build the wall. And here in Nehemiah 4.17, the Bible reads, let me read verse 16. Uh, let me read verse 15. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah. Now verse 17, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and another hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belt in their side. The trumpeteer stayed with them with me to sound the alarm. In other words, he said they had a hammer or a trial in one hand and a sword and a weapon in the other. He said, we're going to build the church. And if you want to fight, we're going to fight. You want to mess with us, we're going to fight. In fact, Nehemiah wouldn't even come down off the wall. Oh, man, if I had time, I'd read more. But he wouldn't even come off the wall. They tried to get him to come off the wall to meet with them, Sinbalet and Tobiah and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. And he said, why should I come meet with you? He knew they were trying to set him up to kill him. He kept building the wall. Now, Nehemiah wasn't looking for a fight. These guys kept saying they were gonna come and destroy them. The church is not looking for a fight either. But here's what I want everybody to understand. If you believe in the church, why church? We're going to stay on our wall building the church. And what Nehemiah said when he had the sword in the other hand, but if you come up here, I'm going to cut your gizzard out. I'm going to kill you right where you stand. And the church has become weak instead of who we're supposed to be. So here's what we do as the church. This is why church, we're going to stay on that wall and continue to build the church and the kingdom and help people. But if they want to come up and fight, we're going to fight back. That's what we're going to do. That's what the Bible teaches. Because we're not going to close the doors and tell people, man, the church doesn't matter. We don't care if you die or commit suicide. We don't care. And it's epidemic proportions. For, why aren't they talking about the suicide rate is in pandemic proportions right now? People relapsing into drugs is in pandemic proportions. And, you know, they don't even say a word to it. You know why they don't talk about it? They never bring it up. Because, number one, they don't care. Number two, they can't help them. So close the church so nobody gets any help. Make the church afraid. I, I'm going to read it. Verse 4. <laughs> Nehemiah 4. I, I know I'm going over just a minute, but if you'll just give me a moment. Then I prayed. I love this prayer. This is the prayer we should pray for our government officials in New Mexico. Then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves be captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. We got to pray to our God and protect the integrity of the church by standing up and saying, we're never going to close. We're never going to be that afraid. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves, they said. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they knew what was, what's happening, 
we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall and, and the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then I looked over the situation. I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of your enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes and your neighbors. That's what the church stands up to do and we continue to pray and fight for those that can't fight for themselves. That's who we are. That's why the church, that's why I'm open. And that's why you're here. Nehemiah 6, Sanibalt, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of the enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall, and that no gaps remained, that we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at once and of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending them this message, and this is the message I want to send to everybody watching and in here. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? We are involved in a great work. Why should we ever stop working? Unless we don't believe in the work. But who's going to help those people that come here constantly, that call us constantly, say, my son, my husband, my wife, is trying or tried to commit suicide. Isn't it sad? I mean, isn't the way we should do it just to say, hey, sorry, we can't help you, we're closed. Sorry, there's no encouragement because we're closed. Sorry, there's no one to pray because we're closed. The church of the Lord Jesus should never be closed. Not by anyone or any means. And why would we stop when our work is great? Why should we listen to the enemy when we have God who is glorious and wonderful. Let's stay on the wall working. Put a tool in one hand, the Word of God and the truth, the good deeds that we are doing, and put a weapon in your other hand, the sword of the Spirit, your tongue to pray and believe God and take authority over these things and say, you come after us, we're going to fight. We're not coming after you, but you come after us. It's going to be a fight, and it'll never end. And eventually, always, God wins. That's why the church, that's why you're here, that's why we're open, that's why you're online. Hopefully, that's a conclusion to a series of white church. Hopefully, it's very clear to you. If it wasn't, it is now. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light on that hill, and we will keep being light to this dark world and saying Jesus is still the hope of glory. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us. I thank you, God, for your mighty spirit that manifested so kindly here to transform our thinking, renew our minds, to think more like you think instead of like the world thinks. Father, it's easy to take the stand. Let's just close and go home and take a few weeks off. Everybody could use it. It takes some stamina, Father, and some belief and faith to say we're still the church and we're going to continue to be the church. We're going to feed some people physically and we're going to feed them spiritually. Father, we're being inundated with phone calls. People who are broken and hurting, they don't, they don't have any hope. They don't know what to do. But God, we do. We, knew how, we know how to direct them to the hope of glory. The one who can fill their hearts and minds and help them on a journey, on a road to health. Spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. God, you're so good. Hear our prayers, oh God. We're being mocked. We're being threatened. And God, we're asking you to deal with it. 
because we're going to continue to build the church one person at a time with our tools in one hand and our our weapons in the other hand give us the strength God the wisdom the favor help us in Jesus name if you're here online or in this house and you say pastor with every head bowed if you're at home or wherever you're watching us from be still just for a moment you say pastor would you pray with me I walked with God but I walked away today I'm ready I want to get my life right I want to come home I want to be part of the answer the solution not the problem pastor would you pray with me I've never really given my heart to the Lord not like you've talked about and folks we're all afraid sometimes Wednesday night I was anxious I was, I was a little fearful for the first time and when your attorney said man they could come and arrest you pastor you need to get arrested I'm like that's easy for you to say but you overcome fear with courage and realizing that if God's before me who can be against me and you're here today and God is moving throughout this place touching hearts and minds you need to yield to him you say, Pastor, I'm ready. Would you pray with me with every head bowed? I'm ready. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you're seated, here's all I'm going to ask you to do. At home, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Even if you're by yourself, I want you to do what I'm going to ask you to do. If that's you in Jesus' name and you say, Pastor, include me in prayer right where you're seated, would you just lift your hand all over this place? It says, Pastor, pray with me. As I look across the church, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. I see those hands. God bless you. As I look across the church, God bless you, God bless you. Anybody else, as I look across, you just, I want you to lift your hand up so you, God bless you, I see that hand, you're raising it high. God bless you, I see that hand. As I look across the top, who else up there would join all these? We're going to pray together. Just put your hand up, put it down. Just, I'm ready to get, God, I want you in my life. That's what you're saying. And I know who I'm going to pray for. Is anybody else, as I look across the top, by the lifting of your hand, you just got to humble yourself. It's not hard. It's called obedient. It's obedient. This is how you get right with God. Anybody before we close, Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for all the hands that were raised. I thank you for people's lives that are never going to be the same, be the same after this, online and in here. We can't see them online, God, but you see them. And I'm asking that you minister to them and touch their hearts and minds in a real way. They would know you and know your ways. In Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I'm going to ask that you pray this prayer aloud with me right where you're seated. And if you're online, you pray it out loud also. And even if with the group, that group needs to play it out, pray out loud with you. And if you're right with God, I want you to pray in support of all those who lifted their hands. So if you lifted your hand, man, you won't be praying alone. We'll all be praying with you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's the son of God. And I believe on the third day, you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. I believe that in my heart today. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for a glorious church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord. Listen.